Welcome out to A Case for America. This is Austin Hepworth, I'm a law guy, here with Michael Hepworth, the numbers guy. We love America, and we like to talk about the things that helped make America what it is. We openly advocate for a proper balance between law and morality, and we take some of our inspiration from America, the beautiful, that talks about the line that says, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. And so with that, we just like to share our balance really quickly to point out that to us, the state of liberty is a state that's created by law. It pulls us out of anarchy. But the thing that keeps us from tyranny is when we have private solutions or private morality associated with that. So today we are talking about the Third Amendment. It's not an amendment that's produced a lot of conflict in America. It's actually one of the better understood amendments, I'd say. It was fairly well written. But the text of the Third Amendment says, No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So generally, I don't think there's a ton of argument over what this um, amendment means. It's generally accepted that the government can't put soldiers in people's houses. They can't force people to have soldiers in their house. The owner can consent. They can choose to rent their house. They can choose to have soldiers there if they want. But they can't be forced in a time of peace. And then in a time of war, if the, sold, if the government wants to have soldiers stay in people's houses, there has to be a manner prescribed by law. But generally, the American government and the people were so opposed to this practice that came from England. Um, they didn't really do much with this. You might find some situations in the Civil War where there were some use of property or other things. But even then, some of that goes back to the South had declared that they were separate from the Union. And so I don't think that all of the constitutional rights were necessarily followed in respect to the South. Um, but in general, there's not a ton of court cases over this. There's not a lot of argument. And so most people just see it kind of nod to history and move on. Um, but today we want to talk about what we feel is one of the principles underlying this that actually helps make America the land that it is. And that helps make America an amazing place to be. And that comes in the fact that the government had respect for the private property of its citizens. And there were restrictions put in place by the founders to say that the government couldn't just willy nilly use private property, take private property however it wanted to. That there were restrictions on that. And that notion is something that um, has helped make America a place where entrepreneurs work, people dream. They work, they sacrifice because they know that what they work for and what they achieve is protected um, to a large extent. But in looking at this protection, there is a cost that comes with it. And so even if we look at the number of soldiers, for example, in America, the government has to house those. Um, so if we look at the number of soldiers, we look at the number of homeless people who don't have homes, who get excluded because of our property rights, um, it's interesting to start to see some of the costs associated with the um, the benefit of private property. So Michael, what are some of those, um, you know, what are we looking at in terms of soldiers, homeless, other things like that? Yeah, we generally look at active duty uh, soldiers. Uh, there's a lot of soldiers in reserve, but they generally um, not full time in the military, but there's about 1.4 million active military personnel as of 2022 in the US. Um, so in you know comparison to the population, not a large number, but that's a, a large number of individuals that need to be housed, 1.4 million. And then as of 2022, there were 582,000 Americans that were considered to be homeless. Um, that's kind of falls under two definitions. One of them is sheltered people that are living um, 
in places like transitional shelters, safe havens, domestic violence shelters. Uh, and then there's the unsheltered individuals who are living in outdoors and cars, abandoned buildings, or other places. So definitely a estimate as far as the unsheltered go, but somewhere in the range of, you know, 582,000 people. Yeah, and it's super interesting to think about what it really means to have private property rights. We mentioned this a little bit before in a past episode, but we've taken the position that it's morally appropriate to say, this is my property. And what that means is we can exclude people from it. So think of your property. If a homeless person came and started camping on it, most likely you're going to call the police and say, hey, they can't be here. And especially if a homeless person came into your home and said, hey, you've got an extra bedroom. I want to sleep here. We're going to say, whoa, 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 no, this is my house. No, no, no. And no matter how sympathetic we are to the homeless situation, no matter how much we want to help, I don't see most Americans opening up their home to the homeless. Um, there's safety concerns for many people. There's other concerns. This isn't to say that all homeless are unsafe. It's just to say that some of them are, and people can't discern which ones are, which ones aren't, which creates a general fear. And even out of hope, homeless advocates, I see people that work tirelessly for it. We still have this kind of safety or security that comes by having our own home and our own place to be. And that's important. Um, and America feels it's important enough that even when it's freezing cold outside, we can say to someone, Sorry, we got to figure out where to be. People die on the streets. These things happen. We pay a lot of money for housing for soldiers. Um, and that's a tax burden. That's part of the burden of what we bear as America. Um, but I don't think most people even bat an eye at it or are concerned about it because deep inside we realize there's something that comes through private property. And so when we look at that and start to think about the fact that the founders said, yeah, you can't use our houses. These are kind of sacred spaces, even against the government. And even if there is a war, and even if there are troops and other countries here, and there's people fighting for our freedoms, we're still going to put restrictions on it. You can't just take it. You have to follow the law associated with it. And the founders did give the government the ability to pass some laws if they wanted to, to define when they could house soldiers or when they couldn't. Um, but again, historically, it's just been a right so respected that there's never been much associated with forced housing of people. We currently, though, see from a principal perspective, if we look at it and say, okay, they talked about it with soldiers because that's one of the most compelling justifications to override personal property rights. Um, but during COVID, when, hos when uh, I said in hospitals, when hotels were empty, the there were some cities that said, hey, there's a lot of homeless people. We don't want them congregating and spreading COVID. So hotels, we're going to tell you, you have to let people in. You've got rooms, let them in, let them separate. And some people viewed this as akin to being forced to house soldiers. They said, well, what's going on here? Um, we can't be forced to do this. And most of that, to my knowledge, kind of boiled over. Um, there was talk, there was discussion, maybe some efforts at it. There's probably some that were willing to do it. Some governments paid for it. Um, but that's something that we saw a little, a little blip of during COVID, but again, something that we really haven't seen much of from a principal perspective associated with this. However, we do see friction arise in these areas with um, things like HOAs. And we start to realize that we start to question if you live in an HOA and an HOA has ever cited you for the color of your door or how long your grass was or putting in the wrong tree or the wrong fence type, um, or denying your application for solar panels, you start to question, do I really own my property? What's going on here? And for a lot of people, 
when the rub comes, they start to feel this tension between good old fashioned private property ownership versus where things are going. And in some states and some cities, it's very difficult to find property without an HOA associated with it. Um, and so this is a factor that as we start to look into, it reveals some about this balance that we look at of saying, how far can we go with things? How far shouldn't we go with things? And one important thing to understand about HOAs is that the government isn't the one making the rules. It's private parties through private contract. And so in theory, the Constitution does not apply to HOAs and what they do because the Constitution prohibits the action of the state. Um, and so we have a scenario where people that aren't government have created rules and put those in a contract that's associated with your property and then they start to regulate all kinds of things. And Michael, I know you have some experience with HOAs. Um, kind of curious to see, you know, your thoughts on some of what may make sense to regulate, some of what rubs people wrong, um, you know, some of your feedback as it relates to HOAs and property ownership. Well, and I think the interesting uh, aspect to it is just the lack of understanding people have about uh, what it means to be under the the rules set up by the HOA versus uh, something set up by the state or the federal government. Lots of people view uh, HOA rules or covenants as infringing on their property rights, not quite understanding that uh, it's not, as you mentioned, it's not coming from the state or from the federal government. It's, it's almost like a private contract. When you purchase a piece of land, um, you know, there are rules associated with that piece of land that you've purchased that you uh, come under. You you have to abide by those when you purchase the land. Um, but, you know, there's discussion about how, how far should they be able to go? You've pointed out instances to me where HOAs tried to ban the flying of any flag. Uh, you know, can you can you via private contract say, you're not allowed to display the flag of the country you live in or the state you live in. Or is that more of a um, a primary right maybe that we need to be able to focus on? HOAs usually are out, they're, they're out to create a certain kind of neighborhood. Somebody or some group of people thought, hey, if our neighborhood looked like this, felt like this, sounded like this, it would be the best place to live. So we're gonna create rules that we believe uh, creates this kind of environment. Um, one of the issues, and I think we've discussed this in the past, is when you try to get really specific with laws and rules and enforcement, um, it usually just creates a lot of argument and not a lot of clarity. So there's rules about what kind of vehicles you can park, where you can park them, how long they can be parked. Um, and then there's, the only way to try to enforce the rule is to get a group of people out acting as a police documenting whenever somebody's doing something. Um, and so generally lots of the, uh, you know, areas that have a lot of rules tend to just create a lot of argument. And so you can say, are they achieving their purpose? Are they not? Should they be allowed to? Should they not? Are there certain things they should be able to regulate? Are there certain things they shouldn't be able to? Um, you know, proponents argue that they create very nice neighborhoods to live in. Um, saying this is due to HOA rules that lawns have to be kept a certain way, colors on the homes need to look a certain way. Uh, other people say it restricts their freedom to do what they want with the property they own. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of back and forth, but I think the way to solve it would be to ask the question about the principle. What principally should we be able to do with our property? And then what principally should we allow um, you know, rules to be created that perpetuate as you pass a deed from an individual to an individual. Yeah, and it's it's a great question to look at because from the balance perspective, I think in general, private contracts between parties should be respected. Those are private areas. Um, but as with any principle in this balance realm, I don't believe that no law is necessary. There are times when the law should step in. 
I personally feel, for example, that something just morally internally says it's wrong to me that an HOA bans the display of the American flag. That one honestly just feels like a right that we shouldn't have to be able to tell someone you can't fly your own country's flag in your own country. Now might we say you can't advertise your business, you can't put up annoying signs otherwise, probably. But again, from a fundamental perspective of just, this is our country, this is our state. That's just a part of everything. And to take that out and pretend it's not, to me, feels wrong. I don't fully have a basis to articulate everything why. And maybe people could make the argument about why it's necessary and appropriate to allow an HOA to ban the display of the flag. Um, and I'd certainly be open to hearing the arguments for and against it. I'm just sharing off the cuff, it feels wrong. Um, but it would be something I'd have to look at in more depth to say from a principal perspective, what are we really talking about? Um, another one that's come up that's gotten a lot of heat in the last little while is that many HOAs banned solar panels. They didn't look great and they didn't love them. And there were lots of bans of solar panels from HOAs. And the question then arises, well, should they be able to ban solar panels? And most states have answered that question. Most states have passed laws now to say HOAs cannot ban solar panels. They do allow the HOA to have certain design requirements or certain aesthetic requirements associated with it, but they can't ban solar panels completely. Um, and that's, again, on this balanced side of saying, hey, look, we know as a people we have to have power. Can you morally and appropriately as a societal morals restrict people from generating their own power and being self-sufficient that way? The law so far says no. Most of the society seems to accept that. But there still are HOAs that fight very much to ban all solar panels possible because they're going for a certain look. And they feel that's more important than generating, you know, quote, clean energy. Um, other areas that have come up over the years with HOAs are things like HOAs that seek to only gather certain types of people. And so there's been HOAs that have said you can't sell your property to a black person. Um, there are religious communities that try and arise where they want to say, hey, this is only for certain religions to be a part of this. Um, there are many communities that try to exclude children. There are 55 plus communities. The 55 plus doesn't expressly say you can't have a kid there, um, but they try and make that restriction through saying 55 plus. Most people at that age don't have kids. And they want a neighborhood free of children. And even with that, it's interesting. I live by a 55 plus community and they have a small park with a playground in it. And I still, to this day, don't understand why it's there. It stays empty consistently. I've never seen anyone on it. And uh, I just think, why is that little park sitting there in a 55 plus community? I don't, I don't get it, but it is there. So maybe it's their way to say, oh, we're kid friendly. We're not excluding children. Um, but you get into this notion of private contract and you say, you know, think about Google. If I sign up to for Gmail or I, I look at YouTube, can Google say, oh, we only provide these services to people that have two or fewer children? Do they have the right in contract to say, we're going to only provide these to people we feel are environmentally responsible and have two or fewer children? That's a it's an interesting question um, because it gives an incredible amount of power to regulate and shape things. Um, and should HOAs be able to say the same thing? Should HOAs be able to say, I think most people agree an HOA can say that you have to keep up your grass and your houses can only be a certain color. That's directly impacting the real property. But should the HOA be able to say, hmm, this neighborhood's only for people that graduated from Harvard? 
or this neighborhood's only for people that are um, you know, UCLA fans or whatever it is. And some of us go, oh, that's weird. It's up to them. If they want to only have it be for UCLA fans, so be it. Um, and maybe that's appropriate. But can we, should we allow communities that are religious based where you have to be a certain religion to be there or that are culture based or that are you know, lifestyle based? Um, should we allow it for lawyers only? Um, and currently in America, lawyers aren't a protected class. And so you can, you can say we don't want any lawyers here. <laughs> That's generally allowed to say, uh, I'm an apartment. I don't rent to attorneys. They're just problems. And there are some places that do that. Um, I know some realtors that openly tell their clients, don't ever sell to an attorney. If we ever get an offer from someone that's an attorney, just say no, because it's too much work to deal with it. And again, we've allowed that type of choice for people, but we don't allow it based on race. And we don't allow it based on lifestyle right now or um, I should say LGBTQ um, type lifestyle. There are areas we've carved out and said, well, this is too wrong. And I think what the law is trying to do is it is trying to strike this balance to say, yeah, we're going to let you discriminate or choose in many areas, but we do have some areas where it just feels too wrong. It's just too, too, um, encroaching on fundamental rights of people where we shouldn't be making decisions based on these things. And as a society that's changed, as America's changed, what we see as appropriate or inappropriate. Um, with that, and I think HOA rules will stay in flux. There will be very aggressive HOAs that try and regulate almost everything that people do. And there will be some that are just focused on keeping the clubhouse maintained and, um, you know, the roads cleared essentially and it'll be interesting to kind of see how that plays out with that balance um but to us it's a principle that we need to look at and say to really understand private contracts and understand that um there might be limits to what we're willing to abide by in private contracts and these are important things for us to look at and consider because many contracts are becoming more overreaching, regulating more and more. And it is very interesting to start to feel this rub and this friction in America as people experience contracts regulating more and more. Can you uh, maybe talk a little bit about what you see as a difference between an HOA inspired rule versus what I think a lot of people typically call zoning or something set by a city or a county. For example, um, I know of an individual that doesn't live in an area governed by an HOA, but they were not allowed to build a shed that was on the side of their home. It had to be in the rear of their home based on what they referred to as zoning laws. Or uh, I know of a place that is governed by an HOA, but there are what are called utility easements at the front of the property where water, sewer, even um, communication companies, you know, your internet and such things can come in and dig and run lines without your permission, even though it's on your property. Um, can you kind of tell us the difference there, what we're looking at? Yeah, it's a great uh, thing to note. So HOAs, so in theory, the way the HOAs are created, it are generally through a process where there's one owner for all the land. So usually what happens is a developer comes in, they buy all this land and there's one unified owner and they say, we're only willing to let other people buy this property if they buy it certain subject conditions, if they buy it subject to certain conditions. And they put those in what are generally called CCNRs or covenants, conditions and restrictions that go on the property. Other states may have different names for them, but generally it's something along those lines that these documents get publicly recorded. And one of the things to know about real property 
is that the nation made the decision early on that it was important to be able to actually put in some restrictions that could go on forever. Um, but that the only way to really make that fair to someone that was buying property subject to certain conditions was to have public notice of it. And so America created a system. We have every county or state, depending on how they do it, has a recorder's office. The recorder takes all these documents, all these conditions that get attached to land, and they record them. And anyone can go look. Anybody can go see your property. Anyone can go see your mortgage. Anyone can go see a trustee that's on your property because it's all public. And that is has been considered necessary in America to give public notice so that they consider it fair to bind purchasers to what was there. And the real reason that was necessary was because at the beginning, if you had two parcels and a farmer was selling one and the other said, well, the only way I can get to my parcel is if I cross over yours. Give me an easement to access it. And the farmer says, sure, you're only going to walk over it twice a day. Totally fine. It's still my property. I do whatever I want with it. But you have the right just to walk over it or drive over it or ride a horse over it or whatever the easement says. And that's something that the, the person buying the parcel of property that needs the easement says, well, I need to make sure if I'm going to put the time and money and effort into building a home and doing all these things that you can't just come take this easement away. And so these get recorded against subsequent purchasers. So if the original farmer that granted the easement sells his property, the new owner still has to honor that easement, even if he doesn't like the neighbor, because they did make an agreement and both acted on it. And the law is going to enforce that. That is, um, you can look at in the private realm, and we'll get to zoning in just in a second here. But the private realm, you can do something like that. Your employer, for example, may say, hey, here's a phone. If you want it, you got to pay 200 bucks for it. We'll get you the rest. But at the end of things, you need to give that phone back to us if you stop working here. Um, the employer, there's not a way to publicly record those types of conditions with a phone. That's just a contract between the two parties. And so if the employee then takes that phone and sells it to someone else, the employer probably can't go recover the phone from that person that bought it. Um, but they can employ it. And we see in America the private property rights laid out in things like trusts. You can create trusts that last for a very long time where you're putting restrictions and conditions on what people can do with property, who qualifies for it those types of things. In Utah, you can have a trust that lasts for a thousand years. And you can say, I put money in, or I put assets in, or I put real property in, and it's only to be used for these certain purposes. When it comes, but those are all private decisions. When it comes to zoning, what's happening is the government is making decisions about what you can or can't do with your property. And this, to me, really starts to dive more into the principle of the Third Amendment. Now, I'm not articulating that you can challenge a zoning law based on the Third Amendment. The Third Amendment doesn't mention zoning. But to me, it's to understand when we look at zoning or when we look at soldiers, quartering soldiers, I believe the founders mentioned that because that was one of the most compelling reasons to take away private property rights. Now zoning, the government's allowed to zone just to make things look a certain way. Um, and zoning are restrictions passed by a government body on what you can or can't do with a property. And they can radically alter the value of your property. Um, where you can literally have millions lost in value if they do certain zoning on a piece of property. So, for example, property may be very beneficial to developing commercial real estate, to building a skyscraper. And the government can say, oh, we zone this area to not allow anything more than one story. And you go, but I'm in an area where there's lots of skyscrapers. I could build a skyscraper, have this amazing business, have this amazing rental. It'd be worth a ton of money. And the city says, mm, it's zoned for one story. That's it. They've just taken an intense amount of value from that property. They've taken that use away. And that's an area where in America, we don't realize how much of our property is subject to zoning. But when we go through the suburbs, when you see 
business district and all the businesses are together. That's because the city went through and said, this area is zoned for business, this area is zoned for residential, this area is zoned for agriculture. And people aren't allowed to do certain things with it. So here in Salt Lake City, there um, is desire for a hospital to expand. It wants to kind of take over a whole city block. And there's a whole process they have to go through to try and get it rezoned because hospitals aren't allowed there currently under the zoning laws. Um, it's not one of the permitted uses. And so they're, they've created a plan. They're trying to pitch it to the government and the community to say, yeah, this is, you should allow the rezoning. Um, and in my opinion of the balance, I believe zoning laws have become too onerous. I believe that they're too restrictive and they're throwing off the balance of private property and the rights of Americans to do things. Um, and I'm not saying that there should be no zoning laws. Zoning laws became fairly necessary with the rise of manufacturing, pollution. Um, they didn't want big polluting factories right next to a bunch of homes. And so there were there was some necessity for you not to be able to do whatever you wanted. But now, like you say, um, I know people here in Utah that they build a shed and the government shows up and says, mm, it's three feet too close to the front line. You got to take it down and move it. And you're going three feet. What are you talking about? Like zoning allows, you know, zoning requires a 20 foot setback from the property line or zoning says it can only be in your backyard. And what the government's doing is they're doing the same thing that HOAs are. They're trying to have a certain look and aesthetic to the property, to the neighborhood. But they can change those zoning laws at any time. It's not the same as a private contract. Um, I know out in West Valley, this was so West Valley, Utah um, has a neighborhood. It's a pretty old neighborhood. And it was built kind of in the middle of a bunch of fields. I think it was built in the 50s or 60s. And so when it was built, the city and their master planning said, yeah, we're going to have these other fields will be sold at some point. And when they're sold, we have these road stubs that we force the developer to put in to connect into these other neighborhoods we're going to build. And so for years, 50, 60 years, maybe 70 years, these road stubs just sat there. It would just be, you could tell that, you know, it just was a road that turned between two homes and it died at this farmer's field. And they just stopped there. They were kind of ugly, but you could tell that they were planning for something. They wanted it to be that. When it came time to develop that, then the farmers finally sold their fields and they're building new homes. This is within the last 10 years or so. Um, the city took, the developer got one of the fields at two of the stubs and they built connecting roads in. It looks nice now, but, you know, it just continues on through. But when it came time after a few years to build on other remaining stubs, the city said, oh, we've changed our zoning requirements. We're only letting you build homes that have a certain minimum square foot size. We're no longer going to allow smaller homes here. And when they changed that, it radically changed what was possible where these home stubs were, because originally the home stubs were on, you know, property that was 0.2 acres, um, not horrible size, but the city said we want a lot bigger homes. And and so suddenly the developers are building this new subdivision and they were even continuing the expansion of an existing one. They had they had a stub in their new subdivision that was going to go into this farmer's field as well. And the city said, no, you got to do it different. Put in a lot fewer homes, make them a lot bigger. And so now what happened was we have these stubs that are still sitting there and they just run to a fence that they put in into the back of a big home. And it looks uglier than I'll get out and because the city changed its mind on what it required zoning wise. And and it's interesting to note that with the West Valley scenario, um, these changes occurred, the minimum house size changes occurred once West Valley started becoming majority um, uh, non-white 
So it was one of the first cities in Utah to become majority not white. And the city suddenly started making bigger homes and doing different things. And it raises the question of, are those two related? We don't know. But in general, cities will try and exclude poor people by putting in minimum square foot sizes. Should the city be able to tell us the minimum size of the house we have to build? To me, it fundamentally violates the rights of us as citizens. There's no way I, I believe that the city should be able to say constitutionally or within the balance of the minimum size house we have to build for an area. To me, that's not the government's responsibility to say how big my house has to be. Issues with zoning where cities for years have required businesses to put in green space and they have these little strips of grass and they're wasting a whole lot of water on it and in utah in a desert should the government be mandating that we put in water sucking green space um and hoas it's it's actually one of the big fights right now in utah is can hoas require you to water your lawn when utah's in the middle of a big drought um, but again, that's a that's one where the cities say, oh, you have to have a front yard. Zoning can say that. You have to have a front yard. You have to take care of it. Why? What if I choose to have rocks because we live in a desert? Um, and so we are in this flux point of a lot of conflict. And cities are flexing their muscle through zoning. They're getting creative about the zoning requirements they pass telling you what you can or can't do with your property down to whether you can, you know, they're even saying right now, one of the ways they flex their muscles, and this is where I get very concerned about HOAs and private contracts, is they'll tell the developer, hmm, we'll give you, we'll change the zoning on that to residential, but only if you put in your CCNRs X, Y, and Z. And so the city, West Valley for city, for example, will say, we're going to mandate that you put in your CCNRs that all homes have to have a certain exterior. But that's a condition that came from the government in exchange for the right to build a home. And so the government in the end says, oh, it's a private condition. It's in your CCNRs contract. Too bad for you. You agreed to it. But it wasn't the developer that wanted it. It was a development condition exacted by the cities and the counties in order to build and that's that's something we're seeing very consistently right now it's kind of a game when a developer goes into a city the city says all right this is what we want and the developer says well this is what we want we want to make a bunch of money we don't really care about the neighborhoods and the city says yep you want to make a bunch of but you want to make a bunch of money we want these things we want it to look this way to be this way we want a certain type of people and so put this in your ccnrs and we're getting to this place of a very unhealthy private-public partnership. We see the same thing with COVID, where suddenly Google will say in its terms of use, yep, we, you know, you agree that we can track you. You agree that we can use location services. And then suddenly Google just says, okay, government, these people agreed that we could do this. So here's all their data for, um, you know, tracing people, tracking people knowing if someone's infected where they went and i remember um, i actually took some screenshots of some announcements that came up and said google's joined the fight against COVID. they're sharing your data with um utah government and it wasn't news sources telling me that this was coming from google they were proud of it um, but we get to this place of the government's realizing oh Maybe I don't have the ability to say certain things. But I don't have to. I'll just tell the developer, mm, we won't give you the go ahead to build unless you put in things that we want. And then they put it in. Then it's a private contract. And the government's doing quite a bit of manipulation right now through private contracts. And even if you think about it, you think about the Third Amendment. Could the government circumvent the Third Amendment by saying, oh, HOA put in your contract that all people agree to quarter soldiers in their houses. Apparently, that's something that they would do. 
And I, I think this all should give us a pause to think about, again, the song, America the Beautiful, confirm thy soul and self, control thy liberty and law. There's a balance here where uh, too often we look at the government and big businesses and say, well, what are we supposed to do about it, right? Um, but I think we should be, take a conscious look at, number one, what we're demanding of our government, what kind of results we want to see out of them. And number two, what we're, what is our, our purchasing decision saying about us? In that, hey, are we really looking at the places that we're moving to or buying homes with or the kinds of technology we're using? How much responsibility are we taking for our decisions that is giving power to some of these groups? And there's a balance between seeking redress from the government to stop some of this overreach and then looking to ourselves and saying, can we do something more individual each day? Can I be accepting of maybe a, a less than ideal living condition? I, it doesn't look perfect. My neighbors aren't the best people in the world, but they're they're decent individuals, you know, and they don't have the yard I would want them to have, but maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. I don't I just think at some point in time, maybe if we can look at what um, our decisions and balance that with what we're asking the government for, we can kind of bring those two back into balance. Too often we're saying I need the company that's building the home to build a neighborhood that's perfect. I want to be able to move into a perfect place and not have to do any work for it. Instead of saying, what do I need to do to make the community I live in a good place to live? Maybe that's too much work. Maybe we don't want to do that much work. And so we ask the developer to take care of it. And maybe the end result of that is that the developer and the government get together, and come up with all kinds of kind of onerous solutions that really put a, a clamp on what we can do with our individual liberty. And so I think there's there's got to be where we're looking to ourselves and we're balancing that with what we're asking the government to do. Yeah, and it's a very good point because I've, I'm often amazed at how crazy HOA restrictions get. And yet they're still full of people. And I just go, the best way to stop a overreaching HOA is just to never buy there. And if all these people can't sell their homes, where the developer can't sell it, things will change very quickly. <laughs> um, every HOA document I know of has the ability to change it, even if it takes unanimous consent of people sometimes. Um, but if nobody can sell their home, and that is something that we still have the power to do. I I talked to one person here in Utah, and this one blew me away, an HOA condition that was in their documents. Um, that I feel is manifestly unfair, but I honestly don't know if the government should ban. It may be a moral thing that we just should not buy something here. But the HOA gets a percent of your home price when you sell the home. And it's just it's just a fee that fluctuates based on how much your home's selling for. But a certain percent of your house sell price goes to the HOA when you sell. Every time someone sells on that HOA, the HOA is collecting a percent of that equity. And I was floored as going, who would move into that when you're instantly losing a percent of your home value? And, but it's full. It's full of people. And to your point, what are we doing morally about that? Why don't we take ownership and say, hmm, not buy in there? Because it will change if we don't buy there. And and I'm I'm amazed, same as you, that many people when they move into a place know that there's an HOA, but the number of people that don't read through the HOA covenants is kind of astonishing to me. I've had um, individuals come up to me, ask me about a place where I live, and say, "Doesn't the HOA do this?" or "The HOA doesn't do that?" And I'm just like, "The documents are there, available for everyone to read." Uh, we sh we should take some responsibility over the place we live. You move somewhere, do some reading, you know, <laughs> find out what what the zoning laws are, find out what the HOA says, um, and then decide if that's really what you feel like you should get yourself into or not. I found out about the percentage on sale 
when I would have title companies contacting me about sales in an HOA I live in, and they would ask about things like that. Do we have any fees associated with paperwork? Did we have any percentages for when somebody sold the property that was due to the HOA? And um, this one I, I'm involved with doesn't have any of that, but it just surprised me to know that it existed. These title companies just, that's what they expect. They contact the HOA and they say, what do we owe yet? And what are we going to throw into the selling price of this home to make sure it gets covered? It's it's pretty astonishing, but not pe many people take the time to actually read into the area that they live in. Yeah, and it does create this scenario where we are calling that it's unfair. Um, and to some extent, there is a point, I will say, if every choice you have is an HOA that charges a percent to sell it, then maybe we're out of balance because there is no option for the private party to do anything else. Um, and this is some of what happened with discrimination where discrimination can become so pervasive that no one can even exist. If all of society elected not to do business with attorneys, my bet is that there would be some legal protection that came in at some point that said, ah, no matter how much we don't like them, we still have to have attorneys and you can't not do business with them based on that. Um, and that's that's what happens once society reaches a tipping point where we take away choice and there isn't choice, the law will step in to try and help balance that and bring that back. Um, but I don't feel we're there in America. I feel there are lots of options and we need to put some pressure on some of these neighborhoods and HOAs and just say, no, you know, let people know that I'm not buying your house because of this. And but even going back to the zoning laws, it's fascinating. There are businesses that will sign leases. Five year leases, for example. And they start building out and they call the city to get their business permit. And the city comes out and says, mm, you're in an older building. Look at this bathroom door. It's not wide enough to fit a wheelchair through. We're not going to give you a business license until you replace this whole thing and you go well historically I can't knock this wall down it's a load-bearing wall I can't widen the door um, and I've had clients in situations where the cost to fix the bathroom door was something like five hundred thousand dollars but they're on a lease now they signed it and they're on the hook for five years and the zoning laws say well we're not going to give this to you because the wheelchair can't fit through the door it's not ADA compliant and um, and so there is this very fascinating tension still between how do we balance these things? How do we work this out? Um, where another situation that came up here in Utah was zoning or not even zoning necessarily. This is more, it was kind of zoning related, but it's more based on licenses. Um, there's been a huge increase with vaping and the number of vape shops that are there. And Utah had a restriction that said the health department, so they have to get a business license for a vape shop and a department from the health and a license from the health department, I think. And the health department was told Utah passed a new law that said don't renew any licenses for any vape shops that are within a thousand feet of a school. The restriction used to be 500 feet, so vape shops would be more than 500 feet away. And Utah passed a new law and said, well, we're going to move it. So you can't get a license unless you're a thousand feet away. These licenses have to be renewed every year, but these leases on these buildings are five, 10 year leases. And these shop owners are going, I've got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inventory. And the state's literally just saying, ah, too bad for you. You've got all the inventory. You've got a lease obligation to a landlord, but we're just going to take away your business license. We're not going to renew it. You're too close to a school. That is a very difficult place for a business owner to be in. No one can predict that. You can't predict what changes in law come. Um, and since it's not, since it's the renewal of a license, the state said, oh, we only gave you permission for a year. That's your fault. You signed a lease for five years. Um, and again, the state's playing this realm of contractual versus law regulation they're viewing a business license as more oh we only gave you permission for a year 
I can imagine if you had a driver's license. They said, oh, yeah, we'll give you a driver's license for a year, so go buy a car. And you go buy a car, and you've got a 10-year payment on it. And then they come out and say, ah, you vape. We're not going to give you a license anymore this next year. Something's happening. There's some fundamental thing happening that I believe the founders would be upset about with government conduct when the government's in the business of granting permission for things it starts to control a whole lot of things. And I think the Third Amendment, my takeaway from the Third Amendment, is it's meant to protect against the government just doing whatever it wants, the government being the one that grants permission. And now granted, again, its text is only to soldiers. So if you go into a court of law, I don't believe that they're going to say, oh, yeah, we're expanding the Third Amendment to include zoning. Um, but I believe from a principal perspective, we as citizens need to work to push back against our government to say, yep, yeah, it's really nice that you're creating these beautiful neighborhoods, but we value our liberty more. We need to be willing to say, we'll tolerate a neighbor without grass or we'll tolerate something because we need to maintain some semblance of private property rights. And that is something that we need to respect again. Historically, the government crazy respected the quartering of soldiers. And that's such a deep societal norm now that I can't imagine the government even trying to put soldiers in people's homes. It'd be so appalling to people. And as a society, we can work back against this notion of HOAs and restrictions and start to say, no, let's let's talk about what's actually reasonable. Let's talk about this balance. Our HOA doesn't need to regulate these things. It doesn't need a percent of the sell price. It doesn't need all these different pieces. Um, we need to understand that liberties are at stake because what happens with HOAs, we'll ask the government to do the same things in zoning. The government will play this game of, well, I'll only give you permission if you put these things in your contract. Um, and it's not a true private contract scenario anymore. It's left that. And we won't go much into this today, but this will lead into our discussion next week. Next week, we'll be talking about the Fourth Amendment searches and seizures. But when we talk about property rights and zoning um, in New York City, the zoning laws say you can only have a certain number of people on your property at any time. And people like to hold parties. Those parties often exceed the number allowed in New York. And so this Labor Day weekend, we're filming this. This one actually comes to us from Labor Day. But the New York City announced they'd be flying drones to count the number of people on properties to know who is out of compliance with these zoning laws. And that, again, becomes this thing of, wow, where are we headed? To me, it feels like we're out of balance at, the, at this moment. We're not to tyranny yet, not pretending that, but we're out of balance and things start to go south when we get out of balance. Um, so we'll, we'll tie more into that next time. Um, but we certainly, as we look at the Third Amendment, again, to me, it's, it's the principle, the teaching of it, to understand what makes America what it is. And the notion of private property, I guess we didn't mention this explicitly, but when we know that we own property, it changes our incentive to work. And that incentive to work is one of the things that has made America amazing. And if we want America to be amazing, we protect and incentivize people's innate incentive to work. If they can build property and they can exclude others and they can control what happens with it, um, there's intense motivation inside people. Without that, without that protection, we lose that motivation. And I, I firmly believe that the, the creators, the inventors, all the people that have developed technology and done things have done it because America has protected private property rights. And America has allowed the individual to set that, for the most part, what goes on there. And the Third Amendment to me, again, is just a very much the founder saying, we're going to go to the extreme. What's the most compelling reason to take private property from people? It's soldiers. And we're going to put a ban on the most compelling reason, 
which to me means all the reasons underneath should be protected as well, subject to potentially some balance. There's always some balance that may need to come in. I don't believe HOA should restrict the number of kids you can have. No, I don't believe that HOA should be able to ban the flying of the American flag. Um, and I don't believe the government should be telling HOAs what they have to put in their contracts. You know, I believe there are some restrictions that have to be there to maintain that balance. But in general, protecting individuals' autonomy in this area is very necessary for America to thrive as it has. So that is it from us this week. We look forward to talking to you next week and focusing on the Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment might take us a little while to get through, um, but we will start on that as there's a, quite a bit to digest there and quite a bit that comes into play with privacy, technology, all kinds of things. A um, lot of friction in the Fourth Amendment area in America today. So thanks for participating and we will see you uh, or we will talk to you later. Thank you.